let's wait for maybe Astrid to join and then mm -hmm. uh, are we going to connect to the YouTube channel as well? I'm done. Yeah, definitely. We're going to start right away. What about my lighting? I mean, is that okay? Because it's professional setting. I've got like five yes, lamps. Yes. <laughs> okay, guys, we are live on YouTube. So I would suggest yes. to start. Um, okay, fantastic. So then let's begin. Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome all of you today to this event on sanctions in cyberspace. Um, my name is Eva Saiva, and I'm a postgraduate researcher and uh, a teaching assistant at Newcastle Law School. Um, this event was co-organized by myself and Eva Tasheva, who is the uh, co-founder and cybersecurity lead of CIN, which is a uh, Brussels-based uh, consultancy, cybersecurity consultancy. Um, our topic today is going to tackle the issue of, uh, it's going to compare uh, the EU and the US approaches, diplomatic approaches to and cyber operations, and we have a great lineup of speakers. Um, they vary, their backgrounds vary from their policymakers, uh, academics, uh, and practitioners with different backgrounds in uh, law, IT, uh, international relations, political science, and diplomacy. Um, the aim of this uh, uh, panel discussion today is going to be um, to sort of write a, a policy paper. So keep an eye uh, on, 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 on this output after the summer. Um, if you would like to tweet about this event, uh, the official hashtag is, well, hashtag um, cyber sanctions 21. And we are live on Zoom and on YouTube. Um, and let me just briefly introduce how this event is going to uh, develop. We're going to start with a panel discussion of our speakers. Um, and each of them is going to have a one particular question, one specific question uh, in view of the topic, of course. And they will have five minutes, after which I'm going to open the floor. I'm going to moderate this event. And I'll open the floor for the Q&A session. Um, you're most welcome to state your name and affiliation uh, if you would like to. If not, staying anonymous is absolutely fine too. Uh, you can share your questions both in, on Zoom and on uh, YouTube. That's, uh, that's absolutely fine. You find the channel you, you decide it's uh, your, um, your choice. Uh, very briefly, let me introduce the topic. Um, uh, you would have heard that in December 2020, uh, the SolarWinds bridge was discovered. Um, more than 80% of victim devices were located in the United States. Uh, that does not mean that the attack was not well, did not have a worldwide impact on the country it did, and um, six out of 14 European uh, agencies, institutions and bodies actually also fell victim, um, victims of, these, uh, of this particular attack. Um, in April 2021, uh, uh, the US administration issued sanctions, diplomatic sanctions, and it officially attributed the attack to the Russian Federation. Nearly a few weeks ago, another attack on critical infrastructure sector, uh, so the colonial pipeline hack um, in the US uh, happened. And in his address to the public, President Biden stated that whilst the attack originated from the territory of Russia, it was not uh, a responsibility of, um, of the Russian state. In the meantime, 2020 was also eventful for the European Union. Uh, in terms of cyber sanctions, as uh, it used its cyber diplomacy toolbox twice for the first and second time, uh, respectively, in July and in October. And in total, uh, it sanctioned um, eight individuals and four entities. Um, these sanctions fell short from naming um, states, state actors. Um, these sanctions merely uh, named individuals, as I've mentioned, individuals and um, and uh, uh, entities, um, and some of them uh, for having conducted um, long gone operations such as the one of fire attack, for example. Um, now, this is a very brief introduction to the topic. Let me introduce our great line of speakers today. Um, we're going to begin uh, with Marina Kaluran, who is a member of the European Parliament and a former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Ambassador of Estonia to the United States, Russia, Mexico, Canada, Kazakhstan and Israel. Marina has also been uh, Estonia's representative in the UN uh, Group of Governmental Experts. 
Um, our next in line is going to be Dr. Astrid Buert, who is a visiting uh, research fellow uh, at Vocal Europe, which is a think tank in Brussels. Uh, Dr. Matthias Ketterman uh, is going to be next in line. He's a senior researcher and head of research on regulatory structures and emergence of rules in online spaces at, at the Leibniz Institute for Media Research at the Hans Brito Institute in Germany. Dr. Igor Katsuba uh, is a researcher on digital forensics and he's a founder of iSolutions and a councillor for government and industry in Ukraine, the UK and the US. Last but not least, we have Eva Tasheva, who I already introduced at the beginning of this topic, at uh, the beginning of this, uh, this event. Uh, she's uh, a cybersecurity consultant. As I mentioned, I myself am going to moderate this event. And now I'm going to leave the floor to our first speaker. Um, Marina, um, together with your views on the topic, I would like to ask you, um, how does the EU and the US views on responsible state behaviour and state responsibility differ? How are they compared? Do they, are they different or are they similar and in uh, which context? Marina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Eva. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the panel. It's a real pleasure to be in a such a uh, distinguished company of experts from very different fields. So it's my real pleasure. Uh, I'm a diplomat, yeah? And I'm a lawyer. And at the moment, I'm a politician. And I'm a grandmother. So the question comes, what does she have to do with cybersecurity? But I have to, I have to, I, I'd like to make it very clear from the very beginning that I'm Estonian. So all Estonians are expected to, to, to program or to repair computers or to know something about cybersecurity. Yeah? These are the myths about Estonians and stereotypes. But to be serious, 2007, when my country fell for the first time under cyber attacks as an independent nation, cyber attacks from another nation, I was Estonian ambassador to Russia. I was in Moscow which means that as a diplomat, I just had to learn in 30 minutes, what do DDoS attacks mean? And how to try to find ways of cooperation. So I would argue that my country was the first one in the world to use diplomatic tools in response to cyber attacks. Uh, the attribution 2007, I would argue was from our side, of course it was primitive. I like to quote, our then defense minister who said that if somebody walks like a dog, barks like a dog, behaves like a dog, then most probably it's a beer. So he was comparing it. And years later, I was at an international conference where I was approached by Evgeny Kaspersky, who said that he would like to apologize for what they did in 2007 to Estonia. Okay, but uh, uh, when you talk about diplomatic response, I would say that one of the most important things is to have clear rules and to have attribution. Because only then you can follow with any kind of countermeasures, any, res any response. 2007, we were lucky that some of those who were behind cyber attacks against Estonia from Russian side themselves uh, said that they were behind the attacks. So they did attribution on their behalf because they were seen as heroes in their country. And for us, it was much easier to find the roots and the, those who were behind those attacks. So what tools did we use then? Of course, we approached all our, our partners and allies, partners in the EU, allies in NATO, because attribution and measures are strong if they are done collectively. If it's only one member state, then come on, where is Estonia in the periphery of Europe? That does that, does, is that country taken seriously? It's a country club. It's not a country. <laughs> and you hear all those arguments. So 2007, what we did bilaterally, we put the guys who were behind and who attributed it to themselves into the Schengen blacklist. We didn't think much about that, but it was a really strong diplomatic move because those people were not able to travel to Paris, do shopping in Milan, ski in, in other countries. It was a strong diplomatic message. Since then, a lot has changed and a lot has... Do I still have a couple of minutes? 
Just sue me when I have to stop. Yes. No, no, please go ahead. I think everybody's interested in what you're saying. Give me a sign that I have to stop. No, no, that's fine. Carry on. Seriously. So later, when I was a Estonian uh, expert at the UNGG, I would argue that we worked very closely with like-minded countries, like-minded EU, NATO, but also Japan, Korea, Australia. No, I'm not going to mention all the countries. There is a huge divide in international community on the role of the use of ICTs. And there is a very clear divide on applicability of international law and international rules. Even if we all claim that international law applies to cyber, in practice, we do not accept that. So that's why I'm, I, uh, I think that our cooperation has to follow the lines of like-minded. And I see that the recent steps have been really strong. Because if, again, if I look back into the history, 2015, US attributed cyber attacks to Sony. 16, US attributed DNC hacks to Russia. 2017, US attributed WannaCry to North Korea. I can continue. When Estonia was joining those attributions, then the question always was, but where is Germany? Where's France? Where are the big countries? From that perspective, the European cyber diplomacy toolbox was a real breakthrough. It brought attribution, it brought responses to a completely new level, a collective response. And although the discussions were difficult, you can imagine, because in the EU we do not have, no, we do not have in practice common foreign policy because states still differ uh, on, many, on many matters. It was a real breakthrough that we started attributing and then we started taking responsibility measures together as EU, as NATO. And that's a big uh, breakthrough. So can, should we be stronger? Yes, I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm a fan of EU and NATO, but I think that as like-minded, we should be even more focused and we should be more uh, committed if the red lines are being violated by the bad actors. Because they are just playing, uh, Igor, Igor is advising Ukraine. For years, Ukraine was a test ground for Russia, what is allowed, what is not. And Russia was just waiting to see how international community will react. International community as such, again, I see that the leading role has to be done by the like-minded countries. So with the US, we are very much on the same page. We might say that President Obama did not do enough. He did uh, not enough and too late after attributing the DNC hacks and taking diplomatic measures, but he reacted. And that's an important thing. So I'm really looking forward that EU will be also more committed with concrete acts because we have now legal ground. We've done collective attribution and we have to understand that we have to react the same way as we are reacting in a real world. So, yes, we have to be ready to impose sanctions. Yes, we have to be ready to expel diplomats. Yes, we have to be ready to answer cyber attacks the same way as we do to attacks in real kinetic world. I'll just stop here. Thank you. Um, Rina, I would like to thank you. Uh, this has been very insightful. I have way too many questions and I hope that our audience has questions too. Um, I'm actually going to encourage our audience to share their questions uh, when they, you know, when they think of them, not wait for uh, me to open the Q&A session. Um, that way we can answer uh, more questions. Uh, I particularly like um, what uh, Marina, you just said about uh, the collective action and uh, the importance of uh, sticking to like-minded states. Um, now I'm going to move to Dr. Vieux, um, who's going to, she's an expert on sanctions. Astrid, um, can you please uh, tell us something more uh, about, um, is there a trend in cyber uh, sanctions uh, between the EU and the US? Astrid, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, let us focus on the very specific and newly developed sanctions regimes of the cyber uh, sanctions regimes, which really differ from any classical sanctions regime we may see being adopted by the United Nations Security Council or any UN member states. Um, because um, since 
1966, we see this kind of classical sanctions being adopted. But uh, the cyber sanctions regime do not have any legal um, framework, international legal framework, particularly designed by the United Nations, as there is a disagreement between uh, the EU and member states to really use any countermeasures to uh, retaliate or punish uh, any cyber attack. So one may see the proliferation of some kind of, uh, you know, unilateral or regional uh, sanctions regimes. And for instance, the one which uh, interests us today as um, the, the uh, US and the EU one. So the US was the first of the two, you know, to develop uh, uh, cyber sanctioned regimes. Um, President Obama decided in 2012 to integrate in the cyber security um, policy, um, the, the sanctions policy, you know, and uh, he waited until 2015 to really adopt the first executive order to counteract any cyber attack after the uh, North Korean cyber attack by the Lazarus Group on the Sony Picture Entertainment. And uh, this very first executive order was the uh, very basis, you know, the very one uh, to, to um, develop the, uh, the cyber uh, sanctions uh, regimes of the United States. And we may say that uh, it's really the, the whole sanctioned regime really developed uh, with the different and various attacks which happened, you know, against uh, the United States. And for instance, we all, well, we have in 2014, 2015, the Lazarus attack. Then we have the, uh, uh, the Russian cyber attack against the uh, US presidential um, campaign. And after that, we have in 2017 some kind of proliferation of cyber attack against the US. And we have, for instance, the Chinese Equifax hack, the North Korean WannaCry 2.0 uh, ransomware attack, and the Nokpitiya ransomware attack as well. And in 2020, we have, of course, the Russian SolarWinds hacks, which uh, was an, a massive, you know, uh, tur turnaround. And then we have the 2021 uh, Microsoft attack, and it massively developed the uh, sanctions regimes of the United States. And for instance, um, there is some kind of, I would say, milestone, you know, with the, uh, uh, the very recent um, executive order adopted by President Biden, because now it really targets, you know, some kind of specific country, because before it was only individuals and entities, and now it's really um, state centric uh, program. So, um, in this sense, I think that it differs from the uh, EU sanctioned cyber. Uh, regime, because we we haven't got in the um, in European Union um, any program targeting a specific states. It remains a list of um, individuals and entities, which is really aligned with the one of the United States and uh, the um, the regime of the United. Sorry, the uh, the EU is recently developed because it, we, we talk about it in 2017, and then it was really adopted in 2019 with the Council decision and a Council regulation. So, for instance, um, it consists of travel bans and freezing of assets, financial assets. But for now, one we may see that um, it lacks of strategy. We need some kind of more um, to, to get to have our states being more united on the on the topic, and we need to define a bit better the uh, definition of what would be a sanctions uh, cyber sanction regimes for the uh, for the EU. So there is a trend; it's really newly developed. Uh, states are trying to do their best, you know, to really counteract any uh, cyber attack against their uh, their installations. So we we may say that it's still in in development. Fantastic, Astrid, thank you. That was really insightful and I particularly like the, uh, what you've just said about the, uh, the lack of strategy and that uh, member states need to act more in, so to be more coherent and have more uh, sort of we are together approach. And this is very important and I hope the, uh, the audience picks up on this and asks questions on this, otherwise I am going to. <laughs> Um, our next in line is uh, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Matthias Kessman. Um, Matthias, I would like to ask you about the legal challenges uh, uh, with regards to attribution. You're a legal scholar, so I'm looking forward to your insights. Uh, Matthias, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's, of course, a, a big challenge to follow up to, to these two excellent uh, speakers. 
I'm not yet a grandfather, but I'm a father and uh, also not a politician. So just a lawyer and a father. That's not, not so much, is it? Um, well, I mean, I'm, I also have lots of hope. That's something that counts for something, right? So um, I am very happy to, um, to to comment a bit on the question of whether uh, whether attribution uh, in itself is is enough of a deterrent, whether the EU should should start uh, attribution. Well, well, attribution alone, of course, is is, is not not a deterrent. Um, attribution would attribution attribution by the EU be a bigger one? That is that is possible. But what is much more important is to talk about effective deterrence, and for that we need a credible, consistent, and carefully calibrated uh, cyber policy. In practice, if you look at the cyber diplomacy toolbox, you know you have the preventive measures, the cooperative measures, the restrictive measures, and finally, you support for uh, lawful responses by member states. And you actually only need um, uh, need, need need attribution, uh, which is right now reserved as a sovereign right to to member states because of the legal consequences uh, out of countermeasures, for instance. You only need that for uh, the 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 very last um, escalation level. Uh, you could conceivably already now have an attribution by the United by the European Union if you uh, would do that unanim unanimously by all member states and the Council. But that, of course, is highly unlikely, and uh, most most likely there would be at least one country who would demand an extremely high standard of proof, which would, in most circumstances, not be easily available right now. I understand, of course, uh, Ms. Kaliorand, your uh, you, the, the approach that that you've you've alluded to, and that you know if, if it barks, it's it's most likely a, a dog. But unfortunately, uh, at the level of of uh, international legal um, attribution, some states uh, would ask for you know a hair of the dog and the exact breed of the dog and the last five uh, generations of dog parents. There must be an English word for dog parents, right? Anyway, so um, what I find uh, much more interesting is to talk seriously um, uh, about the, the 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 way that we can um, make uh, European Union cyber policy more more effective. I'm a big fan of the the framework for a joint EU diplomatic response to malicious cyber activities. That's that's really a a, a good step. But this also indicates that member states uh, can use different methods and procedures for attributing uh, malicious cyber activities and and uh, may employ you know, different different methods and procedures to uh, establish how you know they are they can get certain who has conducted the the, the cyber uh, attack. Um, therefore, uh, following current current EU, EU law there is um, there's more variety in establishing ad attribution than than you, you one would wish for if one wanted to uh, to focus on a, a common uh, attribution framework but I think that another perspective here is is, is more exciting namely that um, member states of the European Union uh, should uh, and the European Union itself should position itself much more strongly on with regard to the international law applicable in cyberspace um, and uh, should should uh, conduct uh, uh, support and, and awareness raising and capacity building uh, it also in those states that um, that that might fall fall victim to uh, to to cyber attacks so I'm thinking more of a a positive proactive um, cyber uh, cybersecurity policy deeply connected to EU cyber uh, diplomacy. So um, yes, as a matter of policy, if we're interested in supporting EU cybersecurity policy, we should probably argue for a stronger EU attribution regime. But this is only one part of the overall uh, equation of the overall approach towards more cyber uh, security and a better uh, cyber diplomacy. Attribution is important, but there is so much to do for the EU to uh, contribute to sustainable rule-based digitalization and responsible state behavior in cyberspace, including, for instance, a strong reaction to uh, threats against human rights violations uh, with regard to cyberspace, as are happening in, in, in Belarus, as are happening in Russia, uh, as are happening in, in India, uh, among, among other states. So this is a, somewhere where the European Union and its foreign policy arm can be much more active already now based on current law. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. Thank you. This was this was very interesting, uh, particularly for me because I also um, am I am a legal scholar. So that was very very interesting for me, and I particularly like the statement that attribution is not a deterrent in itself, because sometimes we tend to believe that uh, officially attributing an attack to a state 
can act as a deterrent, but on the contrary, uh, history has proven otherwise. Um, next in line is uh, Dr. Igor Katsuba, um, who's actually going to talk about the technical challenges of attribution, not the legal challenges, but the technical challenges. So Igor, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you so much, good afternoon. Basically, uh, you know, I'm really happy that uh, Marina had the chance to, you know, because when policymakers go down and try to find out what's DDoS and what's behind, what is attribution, that's really nice. And I believe that we technical guys need to go up to policymakers and be interesting for them. So I don't want to be very technical today just to keep this uh, uh, understanding. So basically, what I want to say, just a few words about the capacity, because as you said, I'm advising, but advising must be based on something. So what I've done right uh, up to today. So we participate a lot in Horizon uh, Europe projects, just because this is really good framework to develop something uh, in digital forensics, in cybersecurity, with policymakers, with end users, and have this real impact. So we work on digital forensics readiness. So we popularize the idea that enterprises, governments, infrastructures must be ready for cyber attack and, and then be prepared to deliver traces, attributions to the court of law, just because court of law is the, the last mile of, of, of this process. And uh, so, what I can say that because I visited a lot of law enforcement agencies, for instance, Europol, uh, Carabinieri in Italy, um, law enforcement agencies in Norway, they're well prepared. They've got capacity. But of course, this capacity is limited. I mean, it's not enough. And, and then there are these national ideas and, and um, approach like to develop something new. And this is how European Commission funded things work. I mean, they try to develop something new, uh, national projects. And so what is technically good today? Um, for instance, in Netherlands, there is Digital Forensics Institute and they've got instruments, tools for automated uh, digital forensics or uh, automated reasoning in cybersecurity and cyber crimes. So all those things will help a lot law enforcement agencies and to have this clear roadmap how to, uh, how to deliver the uh, traces to the court of law. And um, so I just, in digital forensics readiness, this thing I want to talk just a bit uh, because so infrastructures, like for instance, CCTV camera, right? Like, 20 years ago, it was installed on nuclear power station. Today, it's, in, it's installed in your cars, in your homes. And basically, this is forensic readiness, right? We install cameras just to be prepared for something. And I do believe that we must have something tangible, uh, accessible for all infrastructures to be ready. So because uh, the... the, uh, the Beer, the bear can basically be hidden, you know, uh, cyber attacks, we can find something we can say that, okay, that's, that's uh, Russia, or that's North Korea, or, or any country, but we, the global approach is to have clear roadmap, we need to eliminate all those judicial issues, just because all the attacks are cross-border, we understand this. And basically in Ukraine, like uh, we had those severe attacks on critical infrastructure, right? So we saw a bear in Norway, right? But then we need to question this, is that bear an, in Norway or maybe somewhere else or what's that exactly happening? And then we can say something. And so basically when we put more political uh, assessment on, on cyber attack. It's, then it's less legal. And, and then uh, the society can question this. Or in court, there are some problems with that. So I do believe that digital forensics readiness must be in infrastructure. 
Uh, there is really good capacity in all national law enforcement agencies, and we need to provide, and I ask you as policymakers to work on this uh, uh, like holistic approach and uh, eliminate cross-border issues, uh, judi judicial issues with this. And that's uh, my view on the state and uh, um, again, they're really nice instruments provided by European Commission and national EU member states initiatives to develop this capacity and really new projects are uh, coming up and uh, this is really nice, um, really nice road uh, towards safe and, and secure uh, society. Uh, Igor, thank you very much today. It was very interesting to hear the the, the sort of more technical aspect of, 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 of these issues. And I particularly like the uh, your appeal for more holistic approach and for clear roadmaps and for eliminating cross border challenges. This, I believe, is very important, and um, especially here in the EU, where um, some of the previous speakers mentioned that while we do act as an EU member states and EU symptoms have mismatched approaches to um, cyber operations and specifically to attribution. Um, I'm going to move to our last speaker today. This is uh, Eva, um, last but not least. Obviously, Eva is going to offer us uh, um, a more general view of the topic uh, with more specific examples of uh, how the SolarWinds hack uh, actually affected the international community. Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva, and um, many thanks again to all panelists. Um, I think it's a very uh, topical uh, debate. Obviously, uh, we thought about organizing it, but it's also great to have you with your insights in the debate, and, um, and I'm uh, very grateful for that. Um, as for the lessons learned uh, from the recent solar wind hack, um, as you know, I'm a cybersecurity consultant, so I am uh, focused more on, on the security side. So what did we learn from it, and what could this mean for EU as a whole and for our policymakers? Um, I would like to highlight that solar wind um, is a very interesting case, but uh, also the colonial pipeline hack uh, on the other side. It's um, it's another uh, use uh, case or study that we could use in Europe as a perfect example of what we have been warning as a security community in the last uh, five to 10 years. Um, every day in every conference and every paper, we have been warning that uh, the supply chain attacks are inevitable and there um, there's huge potential for harm uh, with relatively uh, limited resources as well. Um, and so for this, uh, seeing the supply chain attack in solar wind where um, a, your trusted security supplier was actually uh, previously uh, hacked. So there was a backdoor installed in their software allows them to penetrate the systems of thousands of government organizations in EU, in uh, US, as well as large corporate organizations. So with one perhaps very well organized, definitely uh, very well resourced and very patiently organized attack, um, the, um, the attackers uh, were able to, uh, to penetrate and to monitor um, the uh, exchange and information of those very large and important organizations for more than a year. So you can only imagine how much information uh, you could gather uh, if you uh, stay on someone's network for more than a year. And I think this is also why uh, the immediate reaction of, of the US and the stronger response in this case was immediately triggered. Um, colonial pipeline as well, it's a very good example of what we have to learn. And so perhaps still we have a lot of attacks in Europe, but we didn't have it's uh, such a scale on the critical infrastructure. So we should we should see the example of our friends in the US, what happened there, how a very important large uh, uh, energy company um, was uh, basically um, paused. So the, uh, the operations couldn't continue with a great impact on the economy and on people, on society, on daily, daily lives. And so, 
with this knowing that it is due to missed security measures so we should take the lesson and try to reinforce security in our critical infrastructure more than we uh, we were aiming at before because indeed it's it's happening it's there um another lesson is okay ransomware definitely it's to me it's um perhaps the major threat not because um it has the biggest impact sometimes it could be dramatic if it if it's a hospital and we have this in Germany, even if accidental, uh, uh, someone um, actually uh, suffered from it, uh, in a, if the hospital stopped operations. Mm, but it's very gr growing threat because it's very um, rich in the sense there's a lot of money there. And we could expect if we have money in a ransomware, uh, we would have more and more crime. And we see this crime on the rise, which is a big concern for many, many organizations. And I think as policymakers, um, decision makers, there should be some uh, action to regulate um, or uh, to provide the instruments for companies to defend themselves against uh, ransomware, because the impact could be very large on our economy. Now, um, the final um, perhaps um, point I would like to raise is again, we should um, we should not cherry pick of okay uh, let's do security let's treat security as some kind of uh, exclusive club of um, of, uh, of companies that could afford and should afford it. Securities nowadays, um, cyber securities, security in general, security of my family, security of my business, security of my infrastructure, of my home. Um, so we should try um, even with the recent NIST directive, which is the European legislation uh, for network information security, which target critical infrastructure as well as digital service providers. We should try um, to mainstream this and to develop the minimum security requirements for everyone. And if you argue that SMEs wouldn't have the money resources to invest in it, well, first thing, first i think it's important for them to be able to continue executing their mission to be secure i think it's the worst thing to happen to a small company to be blocked and to have to pay thousands of euro of ransomware every now and then or that um, their data is compromised so that they lose or, or the trust of their clients and for this because the objective is very important and because again it links to the supply chain attack where we are as secure as the weakest link even the biggest government organization works with SMEs, so everyone should be secure at the end of the day to increase the overall level of security. Because it's so important, I think government and EU should continue and should perhaps increase much more following the example of the US to put our money, to put our efforts where our thoughts are. And so to have this, if sanctions are the, the stick, to have the carrot of the secure public procurement, uh, investing in um, in those tools that Igor also spoke about, forensics, monitoring, um, security measures that would be available for companies and for society, provided by our government that very much cares about us. So this is what I what are the lessons learned I draw. I wanted to share with you, but of course, um, happy to to extend you. Uh, happy to discuss further with if there's any questions. Um, Eva, uh, thank you for this. Uh, I particularly like the fact that you've uh, mentioned the fact that very often victims of these cyber attacks, because we talk about states, we talk about devices, but people, individuals also fall victims, and we should not forget this. And then that security shouldn't be a sort of an exclusivity club for the rich, either companies or states, because, you know, smaller states also fall victims um, uh, to cyber attacks. So we shouldn't leave them behind just because they're small and does not do not have the necessary resources, be it economic or you know, just human resources. Um, with this, our first uh, uh, sort of session has uh, has finished. Um, Marina has expressed uh, the interest of uh, engaging with our speakers again, and I see we've got a question 
on YouTube as well. Um, again, I'm just going to give the uh, um, I'm going to give the word to Marina, but I'm going to encourage again everybody to please share your questions both on Zoom or on YouTube uh, if you have any. Uh, oh, Marina, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Eva, and uh, thank you everybody for your remarks. And I'll, I'll, be, I'll try to be brief, but I'd like to reflect on what you said on a couple of things. I'll start with Austria's remarks on the sanction regime. Uh, as I said, in the United Nations, we have such a huge ideological divide. We're not even able to discuss cybersecurity in the Security Council. So I would argue it's naive to expect uh, United Nations adopt any sanctions on the UN Security Council level. That's just not doable. That's why I think that if we want to be effective and realistic, we have to work with like-minded states. I agree very much that it shouldn't be a closed club. It should be open to everybody who wants, but there have to be some basic rules. If you want to join the club of like-minded states, then please accept the basic international law applicability to cyberspace, offline, online, uh, offline human rights equal to offline human rights, and so on the basic principles if you want to cooperate with us. And we, as rich white countries, should assist. So it has to be part of also development cooperation, capacity building, and uh, programs like that. Uh, do we have to be more strategic? I would argue that on paper we have maximum we can have. Cybersecurity is part of international security and part of national security. In the, in the EU, we do not have common foreign and uh, security policy. It's still the decision of different member states. So yes, we can coordinate, but it's not, uh, but it's not the, the one policy. So that's why uh, answering to cyber attacks can't go ahead. It's applying the same regime as we're applying to international security, cyber security being part of that. So look, it took us two months to have sanctions against Lukashenko, yeah? It took us, I don't know how much time to, to react to other international affairs incidents or uh, violations of international law. So the same will be with cybersecurity. Going to Matthias's remark, yes, international law has to be clear and we are making the same slogan, international law applies to cyber. But at the same time, for example, when we talk about attribution, international law does not demand guaranteed certainty. It only demands a sufficient degree of certainty that someone is responsible. So I would like to draw parallel I don't know, with Salisbury, parallel with the attacks in Czech, where it has to do with providing information to close partners and also your political capital that you are investing in asking for support, political capital and trust. And still, we were able to introduce the first sanctions in the EU. We were able. With Lukashenko, it took us a couple of months, but we did it. With cyber, it took us months of negotiations, but finally in July, we introduced the first sanctions on the level of the council, all 27. So we are able to do that. And these sanctions were, they were real sanctions. Six individuals and three entities were called out. It's a big thing. Yes, I'm not happy. I want to see more. But as I said, uh, I draw the parallel with, with international security, foreign affairs. And from that perspective, I see that we are doing the first steps. I very much like the Igor's uh, comment on, yes, we come from different communities. And for years, I did not understand what IT geeks were telling me. I didn't understand a word. At the same time, I can talk about foreign policy in the language that normal people do not understand. So I think we all professionals have, have to learn to speak the language that normal people understand. For example, in Estonia, IT geeks were inviting us diplomats, explaining things to us and asking us to be translators to others. So that's why I see that our communities are now coming together and I see that more and more IT people are coming out from their basement and coming into the public, going to events, going to the panels, speaking out, and it's a really big thing because cybersecurity has to have, it has to be, it has to have as diverse players as possible, different backgrounds, different cultures, and so on. And my final remark, uh, coming just for a second back to international law, what we need, we need state practice. 
international law is becomes clear when we have a clear state practice. Now for five years, for example, we have the Tiley Manual, applicability of international law to cyber. Oxford has done the same thing. So what I want, I want to see analysis from legal advisors in State Department, in Department of Defense, Ministries of Justice, where they make it clear how they apply international law to cyber. Because if we do not start applying, the others will. And I'm not sure that we want to see application of international law to cyber by China, by North Korea or Russia. In the United Nations, those countries were not even to, ready to repeat that Article 51 exists. Article 51 of the UN Charter, inherent right of self-defense. They were not ready to repeat that in 2017. They were not ready to say that international humanitarian law applies to cyber. So the ideological division is huge and it's there. And finally, uh, Eva, thank you so much for mentioning the multi-stakeholders because uh, cybersecurity for the first time, it's not only the playground for states. States have to listen to private sector, they have to listen to IT geeks, they have to listen to academia, they have to listen to others. The, because uh, just so much is, uh, I don't know, online services are being provi provided by uh, private sector, critical infra is owned by private sector. It's not in the DNA of governments to cooperate with private sector. Again, on paper, we are good. We talk about PPP. In practice, not so much. So it, 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 it's something that is changing, and I really do hope that this too will listen to other stakeholders, because only with all stakeholders we can be effective uh, in that field. Sorry for taking close for such a long time, but promise I'm not going to speak anymore. Thank you. No, Marina, thank you. I think this is absolutely great. And I think this absolutely evidences the fact that sometimes in, in academia, scholars, uh, uh, we tend to be more uh, theoretical and we tend to be more sort of, I don't know, uh, 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 ambitious in terms of applicability of certain rules. Whereas in practice, you know, uh, politics is, is a different game. And sometimes, as you've mentioned, in the EU, the ideological divide is so huge that even though... Uh, uh, well, ideological like, divide in UN, not in, 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 in the UN. UN. Apologies, in the UN, correct. Um, uh, it's so great, it's so huge that uh, we cannot expect uh, um, anything to move forward uh, from there, at least in, in the time being. Uh, we do have um, questions uh, now, and I believe Eva has transferred uh, the YouTube questions on Zoom, which is absolutely great. But before that, we've got a question from uh, Samuele de Thomas Colatin, who is a research fellow at NATO CCDTO in Tallinn. Uh, it is a question uh, to everybody, so uh, feel free to uh, everybody who wants to speak, feel free to express your opinion. Uh, thank you for sharing your incredible insights on this important topic. Also, thanks to uh, Ms. Marina Kaljuland for sharing the Kaspersky story. It made my day, really. <laughs> Do you think that attribution cyber operations to entities and to individuals by using the EU cyber diplomacy toolbox would at the same time boost the confidence and encourage single states to attribute malicious cyber operations to the states, perpetrators, according to the international law framework of attribution. Who wants to take the floor? Who is the most courageous one? <laughs> well, I mean, I can start. Um, Matthias, the floor is yours. Perhaps on the international law uh, dimension, I think we see in international law a development towards a more flexible approach when it comes to attribution globally. This is due to the fact that international law as a law of its time nested within the realities more so than other legal systems recognizes that um, there are actors beyond states that exercise substantial power. And attribution, of course, focuses very narrowly on, 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 on specific states. The law of attribution focuses on states, but the connection between non-state actors and the uh, conditions under which the actions of those non-state actors can be attributed to states are becoming more and more flexible. And this, I think, is a positive uh, development. It doesn't quite answer the, the question, but I think it's one dimension we need to keep in, in, in mind that we are moving towards an age where attribution will become m more easier. Fantastic. Um, does anybody else want to speak? 
Yeah, I just uh, just want to add that regarding the states, because for instance, like a few years ago in in Hague on cybersecurity uh, week, I heard the story like when when cyber uh, crime investigators just bring some information to policymakers to politicians and say, listen, we've got this big issue in our country and they listened to him and then said like okay but there is another eu member state in this case right so can you go there ask them to start this process and then we'll, we'll help so uh, states really because in this question the i i see the notion that uh states sometimes they're uh, i don't know what's that laziness lack of framework um so they don't proceed with that. so law enforcement sometimes they don't proceed with something just because uh, they prioritize everything so the state does the same but the thing is whatever passport we hold in our constitution there is security it's our very basic right and cybersecurity falls right there and basically state must fight for our cybersecurity as well I just want to say that because, for instance, in recent uh, project, we work on cybersecurity of patients' data in healthcare infrastructure. And, and so cybersecurity of patients' data is a safety of patients. It's like, it's like put doctor without diploma in operation room. So that's, that's, that's similar. And then critical infrastructure, it's, it's like rocket. So we've got proliferation of malicious cyber operations right now we see it we feel it and that's as strong as proliferation of nuclear things we had like half of a century ago right so i believe that it's as serious as that and it must be as involved as Um, thank you, Igor. Marina, I, I believe you would like to, um, uh, to, to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, sorry for speaking again, but uh, the question raised, yes, uh, first of all, by Samuel. Yes, I think that the more we have state practice, the more the other states see what the, the, the states are doing, the more they have courage and responsibility to act the same way. So it's always easier to start with a collective uh, attribution because then the responsibility is shared among 27, uh, either EU or NATO. But, and, and in many cases, then you do not have the need to say something bilaterally. So sometimes I think that there is no need for states to say something bilaterally or attribute bilaterally if it's already done collectively. Although bilaterally, you can build on the collective attribution and collective measures and you can introduce additional sanctions or additional measures if you see that the collective ones are not strong enough. On attribution, attribution has three levels, technical, legal, political. Technical complicated, legal complicated, but trust me, political is even more complicated. Because with political attribution, when you name somebody and shame somebody, you have to be ready for reaction that you receive back. And also political attribution, it needs the, the political, uh, uh, political trust of your partners and allies. In cyber attribution, you can't share all the information publicly on media. There is something that you can share with public, and there is something that you can share only with your allies and partners. And that makes attribution to the, in the eyes of public sometimes not enough. But it doesn't mean that the security services or those involved are not having the full picture. So it has to do with political capital. And, and as I said, 2007, we talked to our partners. For example, we even uh, thought, about, uh, uh, thought about triggering Article 4 of NATO consultations among member states. In the end, we did not do that. And in the end, we did not trigger Article 5 because the attacks against Estonia, they didn't uh, kill anybody. They did not destruct anything. They were just disturbing and humiliating for a nation that considers itself being a nation already since the end of the last century. And answering to, uh, answering to, uh, to, 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 to me, hello. Yes, I agree 
that EU is very slow. But as I said, it took us two months to, to uh, introduce sanctions against Lukashenko. Yeah? So in cyber, it's even more complicated. So yes, it needs all three levels. It needs consensus among 27. So hopefully we will have more courage when we have more clear rules and we can uh, we can rely more on specific articles provisions conventions of international law thank you fantastic uh, thank you so much um we would i would like to continue with uh, does anybody else want to answer samuel's question or we can go uh, ahead and answer the other questions because we only have five minutes and I would like to address as many questions as possible. Um, here we have another question and unfortunately probably after this uh, we will have to uh, sort of round up the, the discussion. Um, where do you see the main challenges to speed up the EU collective attribution process compared to US attributions and not better uh, warnifying hardhopper? The EU reaction was rather slow. Who would like to share their very brief uh, uh, views on this question? My just a very humble opinion, just because okay. EU is decentralized, EU needs to think collectively on something so uh, probably more centralized states they react faster but uh, still EU has uh, enough instruments to investigate and to react that's just my comment Marina would you like to speak or does, does that hand stay from is that from the floor okay <laughs> Does anybody else want to answer, or have we got time to uh, answer a few more questions? Maybe we can go ahead. Uh, first of all, we have a comment on YouTube, Marina is the best. Uh, so I obviously wanted to share this uh, with the audience. Um, now, another question. I know Matthias has commented exactly there is no duty to attribute. It's always an intensive political choice. Now, we've got another question from Luca Rassi, who uh, from the University of Rome. I'm congratulations for the excellent presentations. I'm not a cyber expert, but I would like to draw inspiration from Marina's reflection and comparison between the CSDP and cybersecurity issues. We have seen for years a plethora of, of declarations and initiatives about the CSDP, but the EU can, continues today to punch below its weight in security and defense. This EU cybersecurity policy risks are coming to the same logic. Is this due to the fact that cybersecurity remains mostly a prerogative of the member states? And finally, Marina, the ideological divide is indeed in the UN, but maybe an equally dangerous strategic divide exists in the EU. Marina, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, Luca, thank you for raising the questions. And uh, I'm not ready to say that we have ideological division within the EU. Yes, we have a backlash with rule of law and democracy in some of the member states, but uh, ideologically we still are on the same page. I think, I hope it's temporary. But besides ideology, there are also other topics that come into play. Different EU member states have different histories, different relations, let's say with those whom we, to whom we want to attribute some specific acts or to whom we want to introduce some sanctions. And that is difficult. I can say you that as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, when I was discussing the same topics with my colleagues in the Foreign Affairs Council, we come from so different backgrounds and some things that were so clear for me were not, let's say, for some foreign ministers from other countries. So EU, that's our strength, that we are the union, but yes, making us quick, strong, uh, it, it's difficult with 27 different backgrounds. And still, I think that even if we are slow, and even if we maybe do not react the way I would like we do, the fact that we are speaking in one voice, the fact that we are acting collectively is a big thing. So instead of having strong bilateral reactions, I still prefer EU slower and maybe not so powerful reactions, but united actions. 
And, and maybe because I come from a small country, so I know if I'm not at the table, the decisions are going to be made over my head or behind my back. That's why as a small state, uh, we are strong supporters of international law, international law, because for us, that's the only way to survive as independent states. Uh, thank you, Marina. I think uh, your last remark was, uh, uh, was, was very important. Uh, with this, because we are running out of time, I would like to ask our panelists to uh, have their conclusive uh, remarks. Uh, Luca Ratti says thank you. Uh, concluding remarks, one sentence or two maximum, because I believe all of you have different uh, uh, engagements after this panel discussion. Uh, on my side, I would like to thank all of you for participating today and for having accepted our invitation. I think it was a great event. Um, okay, we are going to start with Marina. Marina, the floor is yours for your concluding remarks. Okay, yeah, okay, because fantastic, you've mentioned everything before. Um, Astrid, would you like to say your concluding remarks, please? Well, I haven't got really any concluding remarks except the fact that we have some uh, some regimes which are still developing with their own specificities uh, according to their uh, legal organizations internally. So we saw, uh, thanks to Marina, the uh, EU's one, uh, the, the absence, of course, due to uh, all that we know of the UN, because it's very sensitive, of course. Uh, I just mentioned the fact that we haven't got any UN uh, legal framework because it's very, it's really differing from the very classical uh, regime we have. So in this sense, the cyber uh, sanctions regime was super interesting. And uh, so we have, well, different, uh, different uh, regimes, uh, the US, the EU with their specificities and uh, we'll see how they, they will continue to develop uh, according to the challenge they, they will face. Fantastic, um, Matthias. I'm, um, I have the, the privilege of, of coming from a small country, but living in a large one. So I, I uh, Austria and Germany. So I, I see the, um, the 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 challenges of of, of reacting uh, sensibly to to cyber threats. I um I feel that uh, the the debate that I loved you know I loved our discussion today. I feel that overall the debate is focusing a tiny bit too much on on attribution and a bit too little on the um, proactive positive uh, d developments that uh, that policy that, that cyber policy can also mean namely uh, building capacity ensuring a high level of cyber literacy you know those things start at a very small level it's not all almost all of these cyber attacks are highly you know highly trained uh, programs uh, people with great programs often it's just you know the, the 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 stupid person on the computer opening an email that they probably shouldn't so this is really a societal issue, you know, we need to ensure that we defend our democracies and our societies against uh, cyber threats. But this doesn't only mean, you know, the big questions, but also there's the so many tiny questions. So cyber literacy um, and, 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 and uh, uh, through, through all age groups and all, uh, uh, all uh, educational biographies would be my personal, not extremely legal, but still a very important point to me. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, thank you, Matthias. Uh, you're actually giving us ideas uh, for another maybe panel discussion. So if you would like to share these views, uh, we are going to invite you. Um, Igor. Um, yeah, thank you again. I just want to say that for the last five years, we developed, we, we've been developing a lot of things. And basically, just an ESA a cybersecurity certification, all the approach to have this digital forensic readiness in infrastructures and uh, all the, uh, so the legal frameworks, just because, so after a cyber attack, private business enterprises, just they just want to hide all this, right? They just want to recover somehow in silence and that's it. And then EU itself, all the member states, they implement all these regulations. You need to report, you need to be compliant with GDPR, with cyber. Okay, all your uh, hardware must be cybersecurity certified. All your network devices must be digital forensic ready to be investigated. And all those things with respect to regulations of privacy, I believe it, it creates a new uh, baseline for us human beings to live in a secure society. 
Fantastic, Igor. And last but not least, Eva, your concluding remarks. Um, yes, yeah, so I would um, say that we today the discussion is again a progress, and we have seen that there is progress in the EU in regarding cybersecurity and sanctions in particular. Um, but we should see that we are building a house, and our house is 27 member states house. It's a big house. And we are only now at the level of the of the ground. We are still building our, um, uh, how can I say, the base of our um, house, perhaps stable one. Uh, but it's important to bring the bricks, uh, to bring the windows, to rush up and to to build, as Marina was saying, the technical, the administrative, the political capacity of our cybersecurity if we want to remain relevant. I have seen this in the questions of, of many of the participants. The question of time is also very important in cybersecurity. So this would be my message. And thank you all again. Um, thank you, everybody, again. Uh, with this, um, last comment, maybe Andrew C says, brilliant point from Marina. Um, with this, I would like to conclude this panel discussion. I would like to thank all of our uh, attendees today and all of our panelists. Um, if anybody has any questions, I believe we are uh, very easy to reach out to uh, on LinkedIn, for example. Uh, we can carry on with the discussion. I hope this event was interesting uh, for everybody as much as it was for me. And uh, I look forward to meeting all of you um, sometime in the future in person, I hope. Thank you, everybody. Have, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.